another thing next week. We do have a discussion question this week and exam uh, on quiz two also. Quiz two, again, look at your weekly handout that I send out, all right? Week two, it's got all those key concepts that you need to know. So week four is your first exam. On week four, um, you will be doing initially your exam and then there will be a class to follow that, all right? So it will be a full class in time. Now, there are being reviews. There's three PN instructors, me, Professor Luminoso, and Professor Stiles. I'm giving the first exam review on Monday at four o'clock. If you check your calendars in Canvas, they're posted there. I'm also going to after class tonight, post all of the reviews, the times, the Zoom numbers. And I also will post the um, cahoots that go on with it every week and the study guide, which has just been revised. So that will be going up and being available for you tonight to start studying. I do suggest like one of the you know, one of the students was asking me earlier, I don't get the theorist. If you still don't get the theorist, let me know. We can meet one-to-one. -one. I can go over it to get it for you to understand, okay? It's taken me years of teaching it to put it simplistically, but I think I can help. Between that and your exam reviews, I think you'll be good. And we know that exam will be week four. Anybody? Sure, sure. I want us to know, do you um, take the exam reviews? Everything is recorded. Okay, thank, thank, you. Thank, thank you, Felicia. That's a good question. What I do, as I said, there'll be week one information, what is due, your PowerPoints, any handouts. Week two, recording. We'll have your recording, your cahoots, and I put the PowerPoint there again. And then on exam reviews, I will have exam review recordings. And I'll put the three professors in. I'll, cord, I'll put the, the study guide in there also. And as I get the recordings, I edit one page. So you don't have three different announcements. You don't have to go looking. So when it says exam review recordings, that's where they'll be. And they'll be edited and updated as I get them. They're given on Monday at four, it's mine. The second one is Wednesday at 3, that's Professor Luminoso, and Saturday at 9 a.m., Professor Stiles. So they're all over the place, giving you some times. Now, if anybody still needs extra help, I mean, if you're re-entry, you're repeating, please meet with me before exams. You know, we can go over concepts. I can help you. Maybe it was a theorist. Maybe it's the math. I can help you on all aspects of that. I've just helped um, the couple campuses we're doing. You had to get 100 on dosage calc. In every course, it was 10 questions in each course. You got to get 100 to be able to take the course. I had some students that got four out of 10 right. Came with me, studied, went back the next day, passed it 10 out of 10 because you needed perfect scores. So I can teach you very easily, okay? And I will, I'm very willing to do that for anybody. So today we're going to be going over your um, week two information, preschool, school age, adolescent, and then we're going to do a cahoots, okay? Questions? Again, remember, as we're going along, if you're not understanding, you need it explained differently, please let me know. Or if you have a question or a comment, please, I don't get upset. And I'm sure somebody else would have liked to ask that question, okay? I do have a question, Ms. Bogart, sure. please. Oh. Um, I'm trying to figure out, like, as far as the, um, sorry, it's no, it's be, sorry. Um, <laughs> As far as like the, like Erickson, for example, I put like for the age group, infancy through adolescence, 
And then like the key concepts from the book, what I have read is the various tasks that must be mastered at each age to achieve maturity and each stage builds on completion of the previous. And like the example I used was from the book. Like if a parent constructs a school project for a child, the child won't achieve a sense of industry. You know what industry means? What'd you say? Do you know what industry means? Does that mean like a sense of like a sense of? Think of an industry, a factory that you built, you know, it's producing, you understand it. Mm -hmm. As in, that's what you do well. Mm -hmm. As in school age okay. children, you might be the one who's good at sports, good mm -hmm. at spelling, good at cooking, music. That is your industry. So something you're good at. Yes. Those things, that, those tasks you mastered. And we're going to go in that tonight, you know, with school oh, age. Okay. <clears throat> My bad. And then the inferiority is, guess what? Everything else they can't do, right? Okay. Yeah, I was so, a little... No, that's fine. As we go through tonight, and I don't explain it, you know, um, we've had other people want to maybe stay over, depending on how, what time it is when we get done today. Going over it and understanding it better. Again, I'm always willing to meet at any time that you can, as long as I don't have another class. Schedule an appointment. I'll be here on Zoom. I will not overkeep your time. You guys are busy. You're working. You're going to school. It's accelerated. And I will give you the time that I have, okay? Okay, thank you. No, you're welcome. So... Preschooler. Let's start with those guys. <clears throat> what is a preschooler? Well, preschoolers are ages three to six. Preschoolers on the pain scale are now, they can look at a face and tell you where is their pain scale. Now, before this, in your infants, your toddlers, we have to look at what they look like. Faces, legs, activity. Um, crying and consolability. So preschoolers, they're smarter now. They understand more. Now, in infancy, we know they have gained a lot of weight really quick and a height really quick. Well, when we get to toddlers, preschooler and up, it slows down. So you should double the one-year-old weight by five years, which is triple at a year. So six times your birth weight. If you look at it, double the one year weight. Uh, we know by three years, two and a half, three years, you know, each book's a little different, but you quadruple your birth weight. We know that your teeth are already in. So preschoolers are more agile. We have good control. And are they left-handed or are they right-handed? Well, now they're going to show that. So let's read this. <laughs> a physician visits to treat a cut knee. The mother of a strong-willed four-year-old girl says her daughter's defiance and insistence on getting her own way are wearing her down. In addition, the need for constant watchfulness to prevent the high-energy child from injur injuring herself, other children, or household objects adds to the parent's challenge. She says she's envies a neighbor who boasts that her child is cooperative, plays quietly with friends, and cleans up toys. The mother asks, what is she doing wrong? And how can she get her daughter to be more like the neighbor child? Well, what do you think about that? It's a four-year-old. She got a trainer. <laughs> There has to be consistency and routine um, in order to change her. Now, remember, all kids are different. You've got the quiet child, and then you've got the kid who's into everything, exploring everything, right? And I think a lot of this mother, she's frustrated, uh, wearing her down, because, yeah, maybe she does need to set up, you know, those, those rules, you know, those guidelines, what's expected of her, right? And she's all this high energy. Where is this high energy going to? Is she acting out because she's maybe needs to be in sports, maybe gymnastics, you know, maybe go to the park, 
you know, there are things that can be done here. Um, and it's not all that it's wrong, because remember, this is just right after toddlers. This is like toddlers, right? Into everything, Get, you know, they're jumping, doing things uh, that scare, you know, and frighten parents. You know, they still have not jumped over into um, being more uh, attuned to themselves and what they can do. So she just needs some strict guidelines there. So Piaget, how do they think? Now, preschoolers, now they're starting to understand a lot more now, aren't they? <clears throat> they're starting to be able to take, for instance, a, a stick and make it a sword and a broom, make it into a, a, a horse that they can ride around, right? They're still preschoolers, you know, seeing their own egocentrical, you know, which is sort of still like toddlers. They don't know about other people yet. They're, they're trying, but they still want their way. Now, animism is something that goes on with preschoolers. They think that inanimate objects, toys, teddy bears, trees, whatever, have human feelings and emotions. So again, that's how they play with them, right? They put teddy bear to bed, they feed them, they change the diaper, you know, whatever. This is really a normal part of it. Now, artificialism is things that a child says it's windy outside because somebody's blowing. Or I used to hear the thunder and the lightning was God was bowling upstairs, you know? So there's all different things, the way they're magical in their, their thinking at this age. And this again is relating a circumstance, relating, you know, a noise, a sound, to something because they they can't just hear it and not try to figure it out they're they're in this exploration trying to understand okay so we know that you know again using different things like putting the hands out becomes wings the broom and the you know is uh your horsey we know the knight the stick a sword they're starting to have that logical uh thinking they they try to make their magical into um, what they're, they, they want it to be. I mean, a stick could be a walking stick or it could be a sword. It depends on the kid, you know, and what they want to do. They want, um, they don't really understand later. I mean, these are children who want things now, right? They want to, um, they don't know how to wait. They're very impatient. So cultural practices. Now, we still know that family is the center of the beliefs, right? We also know that older siblings can also um, be an influence on the younger children. And we know that the way they play, the way they go to school, the way they act is all the values, the way they were brought up. Like that girl who doesn't listen all the time. Well, was she taught that? Is it her fault that she's not doing what you want? And now that she's reacting and doing these things, mom's getting upset. But did someone earlier in her, when she was younger, you know, take and, you know, put down the guidelines and, you know, and the rules? Because parents <clears throat> and older brothers and sisters really do affect on the way they act. If they see an older brother or sister acting out, they're going to try to. It's just part of what they do. Now, language development. You have children um, at age three, you know, the, the preschoolers that, you know, are stuttering. Um, you have children that have some sort of uh, genetic syndrome. You think genetics, you think Down syndrome, right? Uh, psychological things would be that ADHD, OCD, autism, or some cognitive delays. Uh, maybe it was something like uh, an infection on their brain at birth, or maybe hypoxia or anoxia at birth. That does cause a lot of cognitive delays. And cognitive is the expression. How do you express yourself? They can't talk. 
um, or they don't know the words or the way they talk isn't working right, okay? It also, whenever you think of cognitive or physical delays, you always look at nutrition. If that child has not been fed properly, it's not gotten the fuel to the brain. Therefore, they will be delayed. You'll see that. And of course, if there's drugs and poverty there, we know that the parents maybe are not spending as much time or, you know, with poverty, definitely nutrition might be affected. Now, bedtime habits can be hard in some households. Some households, it's easy. So what are some things that we should do for bedtime? Well, we shouldn't be have them out running around uh, playing outside in the backyard right before bedtime. There should be quiet time, whether it's reading a book or sitting down watching a movie together. Some rituals, and if we do the same thing or close to the same thing every day, the child knows it's time to calm down, time to relax. Because what happens at bedtime when they're, they're, they're trying to fight it? Most preschoolers think they're missing something, right? They're going to be, <clears throat> oh, let me go kiss daddy again. Uh, I need a glass of water. Or I need to go to the bathroom. Or can I hug Nana again? I mean, you're going to see all of these attention things trying to delay when they should be getting to bed, right? So we know that this attention, if we let them do that, they're gonna try over and over again. There has to be a ritual. We're gonna read a, beat, a book, gonna sit there and talk about the book. We're gonna have hugs and kisses and good night. I'll see you in the morning. Then they can't do all of these other behaviors that delay bedtime. Now let's talk about some play. Now, parallel play is mostly toddlers. Well, what is parallel play? Parallel play is two children playing next to each other. They play with their own toys and don't touch mine, but they can play next to each other. Associative play is usually when you now get into preschoolers. They now have learned and are trying to share. And in that sharing, they're doing things together, like this picture. They all have a bunch of big Legos. They're all making them together. They're with each other, smiling, and they're happy. But there's no goal. There's not somebody who wins. They're just playing together, two or more. Now, cooperative play is two or more children playing together, but somebody wins or they create something. It could be like a game of checkers. Somebody wins, right? Or how about building a Lego house when they're done? That could be something they created. That is cooperative play. Now, preschoolers love to help. They want to do things. They want to be a part of the family. They like the praise of that. So they start helping with household chores, which could be putting your clothes in the laundry, putting your dishes in the sink, putting your shoes away, right? Little things, simple commands. Yes, they're able to follow those. They also, at this point, are what we call the Band-Aid kids. They're afraid of loss of body parts or harm, as in if they get cut and there's blood coming out, they feel all their blood's coming out and they're gonna die. Get it better get a Band-Aid right now, put it on it, all better. It's that age of Band-Aids. This is preschoolers. You know, Christian, my grandson, just turned seven. I have about five different types of Band-Aids in the house. There's Spider-Man, Batman, you know, Paw Patrol, regular ones, clear ones. And if he cuts himself, and then I look, I'm like, oh, go get a Band-Aid. He puts it on and guess what? He feels all better. Now, they are very possessive of their things. And they don't want 
other people to take their thing, their toy, whatever. And it's something that they need to learn how to share. It is a learning process then. So a father wants to send his son to a morning play group twice a week. The parent's concerned that the child will not get enough attention because he's quiet and reserved. What suggestions can the nurse provide for the parent to stimulate the boy's confidence and language skills? Well, how do you boost confidence in any kid? By praising them if they do something right. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, children don't realize you have to tell them. If you don't tell them, wow, that was great. Oh, that's a big word. Or when they do things, that praise is what they're looking for. Oh, what about Kohlberg, that theorist, right? Good, bad, that means reward and punishment. That means they're getting rewarded with praise, which is part of what they want. Very good. Now, the four-year-old is getting more mobile, less awkward. Uh, they like to show they're running and jumping or rolling over. Mommy, look, mommy, look, right? Doing somersaults, jumping on a leg, or maybe riding a bike, right? They can um, use scissors. They can tie their shoelaces. You know, today, thank God for those Velcro straps, right? We don't have a lot of shoelaces like years ago. <clears throat> you know, their vocabulary is getting bigger and bigger. And some of the words are amazing. Um, maybe not used correctly, but they're using big words, right? They want to take things like boxes and make them into Halloween costumes. I took a, actually it was a um, beer uh, case car, cardboard box. And we cut holes and put wheels on it. And at four, my little grandson was out there with this race car on his head and was so proud because he made it, he cut it, he drew it. He used construction paper, made wheels. And they love that better than a truck or anything else because they like to, that touching, that working, figuring things out. And it, it was a great, actually a great um, Halloween costume that he had had. They like stories. They like books with stories, but it can't be that complicated yet, okay? And they are really concerned about death. Where they learned this from, was there a death in the family? Well, maybe, but not always. They're very concerned about dying and they're gonna ask you about it. And I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get hurt and I'm gonna die. So again, uh, talking to these children and answering them, being truthful, you know, and trying to stop them with these fears. Now, a five-year-old, more and more responsibility, more able to do things for themselves, right? By five, riding a tricycle at minimum, probably a bike by now, but not all of them. They can go in, take a bath, you know, they can almost bathe themselves. I mean, parents are still going to go in there and check all those important spots, but, you know, they're able to go in there and draw the bath or the shower, you know, and use soap. They can get dressed, you know, they can comb their hair, things like that. They are at depth at computer games. Uh, I know, I don't know how to use my phone, my iPhone. I asked my uh, grandson, since the ages of four and five, where do you find that? Where do you get that? They're smart. They really understand. Now, what they say about these computer things and games, make sure they're not doing it too much. So discipline. They need to know what they can do and what they can't do. And when they do something wrong, they need uh, some sort of discipline. And they say, time out is what they need. One minute per year of age. And what they say is to tell them what they did wrong and start the time when they're quiet. That's part of the time out. 
<laughs> now, rewards, as I said, Kohlberg, rewards and punishment. You know, it's not a bribe. If you go do this, I'll give you something. No, it would be, let's say the kid got up, got out of his jammy, put their clothes on and came out. Or maybe after he had his breakfast, you might say, oh, you get a cookie because you were good. I mean, it might be those types of little rewards. Um, it's always making sure that they understand what they do well and you praise them, whether verbally or with maybe a little treat or something and always being consistent. Now, some parents don't like their kids sucking their thumb. My daughter was this finger, not the thumb. It was that pointer finger. What they say is thumb sucking or even pacifiers should stop before the permanent teeth come in because then it, the permanent teeth will be crooked. But why are they doing that? Well, what did I tell you about infants? Orally is how they self-soothe, right? They're stressed. What do they do? Finger in the mouth, thumb in the mouth, rattle in the mouth, something. Shirts in the mouth as they get older. It's all about calming themselves down. We know that oral satisfaction is the way children deal with a lot of stressful things in life. Now, bedwetting. Bedwetting is something that can happen. It could be something, you know, that is for no reason, just that they, they're bed at night. So primary, it's never been dry. It's always been wet. That someone who, you know, maybe needs medication or therapy or before that, even stopping them having fluids, right? After a certain amount during the day. Now, secondary is the one that's concerning. You've had your children, they're eight years old, they haven't wet their bed in a long time and they start wetting their bed. It's usually due to a reason. It could be a urinary tract infection. So what are some signs and symptoms of diabetes mellitus, diabetes insipidus? And that's a lot of urination for both of them. At seizures, you lose control of your bowels and your bladder. It could be a problem with obstructive no. uropathy. In obstructive uropathy is like a kink in the ureter or a valve that's not working good. That is, means the urine doesn't pass the way it should. What if there's a kidney stone, right, that we didn't know about? And then there are things, sleep disorders. Younger kids can have panic attacks during their sleep, and that could be part of the sleep disorder. So what do we do? You know, what is our role as nurses with children? Mom says, you know, never been dry. Well, find out the information. How long have they ever been dry? Um, have they always wet the bed? Is it a certain time of night they wet the bed? How many times a week? Or is it every night? When they urinate, how many times during the day? Is it a full stream? Or is it just a trinkle? Is there pain with urination? And then fluids, especially between dinner and bedtime. We know that decreasing, that's the first thing that we would do. Decrease the amount of fluids. Now, they do need fluids during the day, but closer to bedtime, it should be decreased. Sometimes it's medications that they need, as I said, that will hold them during at night. And sometimes there's medications that can cause them to also be, have their beds wet. So uh, we know sometimes uh, there's something going on in the family. Maybe it's divorce. Maybe there's violence. Maybe there's alcohol or drugs, something. Family history is important to figure out. And what stress is going on? Did daddy get deployed to Afghanistan? All of these things can make a difference with a child, okay? I have a so, question. Sure. What age is it considered like normal to be wet during the night? What is a normal age? Well, 
Usually by the time they get to preschool, they should be potty trained. So between four and five. Now, it doesn't mean um, during the day they're dry, um, but at night they're wet. So sometimes um, it's limiting the liquids, making sure they go to bathroom before they go to bed. Sometimes it's so much stress, you know, and there are some kids who worry about everything. So it could be some sort of behavior modification, hypnosis, something. Or during the day when they have to go to the bathroom, make it hold it a little bit longer. And that will strengthen the bladder muscles, the sphincters, so that they can hold it longer, okay? So a foster parent takes care of a five-year-old who's required to visit her biological mother every weekend. The child wets the bed for one to two nights when she returns to the foster home and then stays dry until after the next weekend. The foster mother calls the clinic and asks the nurse how could she handle the bedwetting? What counseling can your nurse provide? Well, couldn't she say like... um ask her i know when my daughter used it on herself like it's because she has something to drink like right before bedtime or too much to drink or she could be scared had a nightmare and being somewhere like um you know different maybe you know like it the, seems like you know she's going to visit her biological mother right mm -hmm. that biological mother's trying to please her so she's right. giving her things to drink, ice cream, ice pops. Yeah. That's all considered liquid. And that could be the cause of it. It's definitely probably the cause because it's like she might have a schedule here and then might not do it. But then when she goes here, it's like, you know, like you just said, all the good stuff and not a cutoff time. And then might, maybe that's what's happening. I absolutely, that's exactly what I get from this little critical thinking discussion question. It's, you know, they're trying to please the child, you know, and they're actually doing something where in foster home, they cut their fluids off. You know, they they do different things, more on a structured um, regimen. So preschoolers love activities. They love getting together, reading books, dancing. Um, they love coloring, making projects. They do all of that. And having them work together as teams instead of singularly alone, that makes them into be able to work with groups and how to cope with other children that are different, right? Also, um, when they're working together, these children are learning from each other. All kids do things differently. So now it's building up, oh, I did that different. Oh, I like that. Kids talking to each other. And that builds themselves up, gives them good self-esteem. Again, a kid who's happy, feels good about themselves, is going to behave like a kid who likes themselves too. You know, kids do need to take a daily bath just to rinse off. They don't necessarily need their... Sh uh, ha shampoo their hair every day, um, but at least twice a week. You know, Christian had hair down below his ears until one day about a month ago. He cut it like this because he was tired of sucking on his hair. And now he has like a buzz cut. So when it was shorter, it was every day. Mom and dad used to wash his hair. But now it's a rinse off. It's so much easier. But he looks so cute with long hair, you know. But then, of course, you have to do the right grooming that you do need. Remember, clothing shouldn't be too tight. It should be loose. And because these kids are active, running, jumping, everything, you don't want it to strangle them. And, of course, we want it to be able to be washable. Kids are in everything. Food down the front. You know, I take up the use it, the shirt for the napkins. It's just normal. And of course, they need really good shoes. They need to be supportive uh, as in not going outside without shoes on, right? They need good sneakers, protect the feet. Now, accidents are a big thing um, in all children. Now, preschoolers are more active, right? They are more mobile. 
They're outside, they're playing in driveways, front yards, balls rolling into the street. They're out in parking lots, running around, you know, mother doesn't grab the arm quick enough. Motor vehicle is the highest of all accidents, unintentional, okay? We also know car safety is important. They need to be in a fr uh, front sit facing car seat up to the age of seven, eight, and then they could be in just a bunker seat. Um, and again, it also depends on the height and the weight of the kid and what the um, car seat says um, in order to do that. But they need to be buckled in for sure, back seat. They can't be in the front seat actually until they're, uh, they say 11, believe it or not. Children put everything in their mouth. They are able to get into cupboards and get into things they shouldn't. So poisoning is huge. Um, again, if they're putting stuff in their mouth, they're, um, you know, uh, if it's a substance, again, um, always have that poison control number down. You know, we don't use Epicac and we don't induce vomiting anymore. We call poison control first and get their opinion, okay? Again, these kids are smart. You need to tell them stranger danger about motor vehicles, looking both ways, um, being alone um, in places, you know, being safe, where to go, who to go to, okay? All of these things are important because at times you do get separated and it's, you know, it just happens. What if you're at a big youth fair? Happened with my youngest son. I always told him, we ever get separated, you find a policeman and you don't leave, stay there. Mommy will find you. It happened once. And he wouldn't go to the information counter. No, my mommy said to stay here. And I came around the corner. So again, teaching those things. Now, young preschoolers, it's not uncommon for imaginary playmates. But if they're eight years old, it's not normal, okay? That might be some psychological problems, just to let you know. Imaginary playmates are there when they're lonely. They can sit there and, okay, come with me. Let's go into this dark room. I need to go get a toy before I turn the light on. It actually helps them through a lot of their fears. So timeouts, again, one minute per uh, year of age, not a problem, right? Now, hospitalization is frightening, especially what if mom can't be there? Somebody can't be there all the time, right? You're left with a nurse. Um, separation anxiety is in basically four stages, but we call it three, all right? <clears throat> what happens if you take your child, you have to leave, they're in a hospital. What's the kid going to do? They're going to cry, right? First, they're going to cry, 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 cry. Then all of a sudden they get quiet and they regress, start sucking their thumb. They might become incontinent when they're potty trained, right? And then the last stage, depending on how long the separation was due, maybe it was, you know, for a day. They had to go home. They had to do this for the other children. They had to go to work the next day. And then they came. Well, maybe they don't even pay attention. Mommy's there. You're going to have a discussion question on separation anxiety. And that's what it's all about. And why do we need to know that? Well, how are you going to take care of these children during these times? You know, parents do need to go to cafeteria and get food. Parents do need to go home and get a change of clothing, right? Um, or go to the bathroom even. And, and they're separated at times. So important that we know those things. So what is the child's approach to play? Now, this is a nurse sitting back and look. Are they doing it nice or are they beating up the dolls, beating up the toys? You might see some violence in that family, right? It's not normal for a kid to be you know, breaking everything, right? It's more that magical talking with his preschoolers. When you take a 
a preschooler and put them in groups? Do they go over and try to play or do they stay on the outside and just watch until somebody calls them in? Do they like to be running or do they like to be sitting alone with a group of things around them quietly? Are they talking to the other people that they're with, the other kids? Are they trying to be in part of that imagination, that magical thinking that everybody's trying to do with these toys together? Because remember, preschoolers are more associative play, playing with these toys all together, right? And what type of attention span? Do they have five minutes, 10 minutes, 30 minutes? Well, probably about 15 minutes is the longest you'll get a kid to sit and to pay attention to something. And is that normal? Yes, it is. Now, Denver Developmental Exam, there is a YouTube, you can push on it, but basically all it does, it is not an IQ test. It does it has nothing to do with that. All it does, it tells you if you have need for speech, physical, occupational therapy, if you need something, that's all it says. Nothing to do with IQ. Now, one parent wants to send her child to a preschool program for three mornings a week. Another parent who has a developmentally disabled child also wants her child to experience the benefits of a group care setting for part of the week. How should each parent evaluate potential programs to determine the suitability for the child? And what features should the parent of developmentally disabled child to look for? Well, I look at this and I say, developmentally disabled, what do you mean? Is it speech? Is it cognition? Is it motion, motor, right? All of those things are going to depend on a lot of these developmentally disabled children, cognitively delayed children. There are many daycare alternatives and preschool alternatives. And a lot of times the physician orders them. And a lot of times insurance, the Medicaid, the insurance pays for it. So a child who is developmentally fine um, can go to a regular preschool program, just making sure always, what do you do in you know, your preschool? What, what is your routine? Making sure there is a routine. Are they fed? What are they fed? What sort of activities, et cetera? So, I mean, putting a kid in daycare or putting a kid in some sort of program it must be specific to that child. What do they need? So school age. School age, ages 6 to 12. Now, 6 to 12 is a big group. A 6-year-old is still an infant. They're still a child. And a 12-year-old is rated adolescence, right? So it starts out with the loss of their teeth and it ends with the end of all their permanent teeth and, and beginning of puberty. So it's amazing what they go through at this time. School age children are very close to same sex peers. This is how they communicate and talk to each other. Their friends mostly are same sex, all right? We know that school-age children, what they do well, they're going to be told that they do that well. As in, sense of industry, what do I do well? And what I do well, I want to emphasize on that school-age child because that gives them a feeling of feeling great great self-esteem, right? And it's showing the peer groups. I'm the fastest. I spell the best. I can play a piano. I can read better. Uh, my math is good. My writing, whatever the skill is, you know, and they do it well, that gives them their sense of self-esteem. We know that it starts with they can read, they can write, 
but now they're getting into more understanding about what they're reading. You know, initially they just get the basics. They, they don't get, you know, more in depth. They start to understand it a lot more. These children, you don't have to give them that reward or that praise, you know, right away. They can wait for it. They know they'll get it, you know, when they do things well, but it's not like a preschooler. You need to praise them as you go along. We know some school age children, you know, let's say that they wanted to do gymnastics and they keep trying and they're still not good at it. You know, the thing is, they can't be good at everything. And the one thing we don't want to do is to give them that fear of trying because kids they need to try it again at another time. So Erickson, stage of industry. Industry is my business. That's my industry. That's my house. That's my business. I do well. And the inferiority is what I can't do well. And I wish I could. Freud's sexual latency, again, is all about same-sex peers at this stage. They believe that, you know, two girls or two boys, uh, friends, is what they need to communicate and talk about life's events, right? Piaget is concrete operations. Oh my God, what does concrete mean, right? Well, think of concrete something solid and formed, and it's there. Think about stuff that a child has seen and learned and touched and felt before. They've seen it, it's concrete in their brain. Now they can use it, okay? They start to see some children, they like to take their closets and put all the, sh the short sleeve shirts, sleeveless shirts, long sleeve shirts. Sometimes they put the colors together, um, even in their drawers, maybe even in their underwears or socks. Toys, putting them into, all right, all of the blocks go here, all of the trains go here, all of the dolls go here. It's that organization. They start to understand there are differences between things, okay? Is this the, um, as far as this goes, was that what you mean when you said the key concept, like for Freud, here's the sexual latency and then PJ is the concrete operations? Yes. Okay. Yes. Concrete is what you see and you know. Remember, concrete is all about what they think. Remember that. Piaget is what you think, what you have learned, and now you do one step more. You learn how to grasp the rattle, then you put it in your mouth. So it's a step. It takes, you build upon it. Okay? Now, physical growth, we know 6 to 12, they're going to grow a lot. They're going to gain a lot of weight. Um, I think the biggest thing is their teeth. All of the baby teeth come out. All the prim primary teeth come in. They say they start losing teeth about six years old. We know that their weight and their height is still slow. And it steps there. They gain weight. They gain height. They gain weight. They gain height. Gain weight. And that's absolutely normal. All of their body systems becomes more and more mature. Their GI system is able to have three meals a day, not six small ones like younger kids, right? Um, you don't need as much calories because they're not growing as quick. And the heart is now not in the chest, a big heart. It now is more proportioned to the whole body. Now, one of the things with school-age children you have some nine-year-olds that look like 16-year-old girls. You know, maybe they've gone through uh, puberty quicker, right? So remember, what they look like, their size, does not relate to how they are mentally, their emotional maturity. One of the things, I've got a nine-year-old grandson who weighs 145 pounds. He looks like a 12 or 13-year-old boy, but mentally... He is a nine-year-old. 
And it's something that you have to remember that when we treat these children getting on their developmental level, you don't want to go over it, okay? Genders, yes, they know boys, they know girls. Again, they still want to have that same-sex peers. It's what Freud says, it works. We know that there's differences in the way people are treated if you're a boy or a girl, and some of it is cultural. Well, why can my little brother do that? Well, because he's a boy, right? Have you ever heard that? And this is something, uh, that gender identity that goes on there. With school, you know, we need to be realistic. You're going to have children um, that are smarter than others, ones that take longer to learn, and all of these things are normal. But we need to do things like make sure that they get to school on time, that they don't miss. And then looking for things in children. If all of a sudden a kid is not turning in homework, or you see a child, is, especially school nurses this, see a child is missing and late um, or doesn't look as well kept. Uh, something's going on and it's something that needs to be looked at. Um, it could be some, you know, things going on at home, right? It could be that, you know, there's a divorce going on or other stuff. You don't really know. So, in school, one of the things a school nurse does would be pull that child in. Hey, what's going on at home? You know, to let them try to express their fears because um, they don't know what to do with them. They don't know how to deal with it. And they need somebody who's responsible to do that. Now, another thing is we as parents want the homework to get done, right? So we sit there and help them do it because it gets it done quicker and you can put it away and you can get dinner done and oh, that's over, thank goodness, right? Well, it should be the responsibility of the child to get it done. Tell the child, go get it done. Now, can you check it? Of course, but that kid should be the one doing it um, because then the teacher can see what questions they uh, didn't do right and then they could get that extra tutoring that they need. And that's the way that the philosophy they think now. Sexuality, again, school-age children. There's all different words that they use. I mean, when Christians started coming home and saying, oh my God, I'm like, don't say that. Oh my gosh, oh my goodness. <laughs> you know, it was one of the things I told them to say. But there's all things they learn these at school, you know, just understanding what they are, um, asking them um, so that you know, are they saying something wrong or is there something happening? Uh, you know, the way they talk, we can figure it out. And you know, kids don't always understand the words that they're saying, they just heard it. So they just repeat it, right? Six-year-olds still are very energetic. They're getting up, getting it up, going. And they like to do things and then move on to the next, then move on to the next, right? You might have three games out or you might have a couple sets of clothes. I wanted to put that, but no, I put this, but no, I put that. It's just, they start tasks, they don't always complete them. So making sure that they do it. Sometimes they're just talking a mile a minute and what are they talking about? Is they like to hear themselves talk, right? Their vocabulary is huge. It's getting a lot better, uh, a lot bigger words. They're sleeping 11 to 13 hours. And we know that at school age, girls like to play with girls and boys like to play with boys. It's just part of normal human nature. A kid is starting to get stressed, like I said, maybe you know, not eating or overeating or having problems with school or getting tummy aches. Uh, these things that weren't normal, remember, parents should know that this could be a sign of stress and the parents need to be aware of those things. We know that they've got all their immunizations and if not, we should always um, stress that importance of it. And we know that as they get older, 
How many infectious diseases have we come in front of? How many upper respiratory, tonsillitis, stress, ear infections, you know, um, and chickenpox is one of them that they can also be, even if with a chickenpox vaccine, it's not uncommon. Seven-year-olds, again, they're, they're more modest. They close the bathroom now. They don't want to watch you when they're in the bathroom or taking their baths or showers or if they're changing. They're funny as funny can be, right? They love to be active, running, riding bikes, skateboards, whatever. Um, but they do like the time to sit and relax and play a video game, watch a movie or whatever. They have been taught about spring, summer, winter, and fall. And they know in the difference. You know, I live in South Florida, so there's not much, but they've heard about what happens in other places. They're understanding math. You know, when your kid at age three is telling you two plus two is four, four plus four is eight, eight plus eight is 16, 16 and 16 is 32. And it went all the way up to 256 plus 256 is five, uh, 12, you're like, oh my gosh. Well, that's something that Christian has always excelled at. And you're gonna see that industry, different types and people. Hands are getting steadier, writing's getting better. And again, trying to be independent, um, doing things on their own. Eight-year-olds wanna be a part of everything. They can play alone, they don't care, they're creative. They love competitive sports and they understand when grandma and grandpa come, they better behave properly. And they do because they understand the reason why, okay? They are hero worship. If it's Spider-Man, Batman, or mommy or daddy, right? Uh, or it could be Nana or Pop Pop. They will have somebody that they look up to. Their arms and hands are growing quicker than the rest of their body. Muscles are getting developed, right? They're playing sports, they're running, they're more active. They love to argue with you. They want to be right still, right? And the thing we need to teach them is when they're angry, what they can do to act out their anger, not slamming doors and breaking things, right? Something that starts as a young child. Nine-year-olds, now these are more dependable and they need to have more responsibility. They wanna be a part of the family and activities. You know, if we're going out to dinner or going bowling or playing a, a game, card games, even though it's an adult game, they wanna be a part of it. They probably will start finishing what they begin in tasks, okay? Now, younger kids don't like to be criticized for doing wrong. So you have to be careful in the way that you tell your child you did that wrong. Now, nine-year-olds are more available, amenable to accept that criticism. They, of course, they're little worry warts. They worry about everything. It's just part of them that, you know, their social being worrying about mom or dad or whatever. Hand-eye coordination, well-developed. That's why they can pitch a ball in Little League, right? Um, they have about 10 hours of sleep. They got their permanent teeth coming in and they do like sports, whether it is that Little League, whether it is soccer, whether it's gymnastics, you know, whatever it is they do um, are very active and they love those things. So a reserved eight-year-old child tends to isolate himself from other children and doesn't want to be a part of the group. What types of interventions and guidance can the school nurse provide? You always have the quiet kid, right? Anybody? Well, Pull the kid into like the office and ask if there's any problems going on, what's causing him to, to do that. That could be it. Yes, very good. Uh, yes, definitely it could be part of it. Or maybe as the school nurse, maybe 
um, watching them play and try to make them a part of it, make them feel like they belong there. Because, you know, kids, I don't know them. I don't want to be there. It's, you know, that's not right. They don't know it's okay. Very good. That was a very good point. Pre-adolescence, now we're starting 10, right before you get adolescence. This is where they're starting girls and boys growing and maturing. This is where um, you see girls are going to be taller than boys because girls grow two years before boys. That's why when you're in fifth and sixth grade, you know, the boys are shorter than you. You're taller than all of them. And they're silly. They're stupid because girls, even emotionally and hormonally, they're, they're becoming more of young adults, okay? We know that, of course, they want to be independent, do what they want when they want because they think they know what they're doing now. We know sexual curiosity is there. Um, they don't know what to do with it yet. Um, we know girls tend to be more able to adapt to situations, more being more poised, okay? They're going to be a part of the gang, the group, and those slang words will be coming in. And they'll be the ones that, oh, that's the kid who plays baseball well. Oh, she plays the piano. As in, you're identified by what task is your industry, what you do well, right? And they're going to be more into body appearance, whether it's you want the cooler glasses, you want your hair with the bows or, you know, uh, shoes, sneakers. You, you want to be cool. Your, your personal um, view of yourself, you want it more. You, you want to look good, right? And now we're starting to understand abstract type things, things that aren't you know, in the normal realm. An abstract number would be a negative two. What does that mean, right? And they start to understand things of like that. Your 11 to 12 year olds, they are so intense observant and they're still um, very energetic. They love to try to tell you what and how to do everything. They like to be in the middle of everything telling everybody what to do, right? They don't want, um, at this point, they want to have more freedom and less limits because they think that they're being grown up now. They're not quite there yet, but they feel they know enough to be able to do things on their own. They still need to be in groups, whether it's in Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts or sports or gymnastics, whatever. They need groups. Really important because sharing ideas between all of them. They're, again, still looking at their bodies. 11, 12-year-olds, they're starting to get curves and breasts and, you know, hair in places they didn't have. They're, they're interested. They're watching themselves growing up. And um, they need some responsibilities at this age. I mean, younger kids need something. Maybe put your clothes in the laundry you know, maybe make your bed. I know at five, six years old, I was. Um, maybe that or chores, taking the garbage out or feeding the, the dog or the cat or getting the dishes, setting the table, clearing the table. These are good. It shows responsibility. So health examinations. You know, usually schools are telling you, you know, you need a physician signature or immunizations prior to going to school, you know, especially at that 12 year old age where, you know, you're going to need hep B or HPV um, three dose series. These things um, are usually done at certain ages, but usually we do that right before school starts. Most parents will take them in and get their annual checkup. Now, if they're in school, they can't hear, they can't see, um, they're squinting. These are things that um, teachers would send them to the school nurse and the school nurse would um, screen them and then send the parents, you know, a note, hey, I think you need your hearing checked or I think he needs his vision checked, right? And we know 
kids do need that PE in school. We want to make sure they're able to move and run and jump and do the things that they should. Children need an explanation when they're sick. Now, one of the things with school-age children, your younger school-age children, they're still thinking like the preschooler. They think that they're being punished by God if they get hurt or like if they need to go to surgery, like for an appendix. And they think they're being punished. I hit my sister yesterday. That's why I fell down. I broke my arm. My appendix popped, right? They think these things. So a simple explanation. You did nothing wrong. Again, they're still into body parts coming out and oozing over and dying, right? Explaining, we'll put band-aids and extra stitch. You know, they're not going to bleed to death. Their insides aren't going to fall out. These are things I, I will tell when I was in the ER and they'd be going for an appendix. I would tell them, you did nothing wrong. That just thing there, it just needed to come out. It didn't serve a purpose. Don't worry. I'll tell the doctor, put an extra stitch in there. We'll put a Band-Aid on it when it's done. You know, simple explanations. Um, broken bone, showing them pictures, right? I used to love showing my uh, children with broken bones, fingers, whatever, the x-ray. Because when they see it, they know what's going on. And then to explain what they needed to do to make it feel better quicker, right? They need responsibility to make sure their school supplies come home. Uh, how many times can you buy crayons, pens, papers, notebooks, because they're not uh, taking responsibility. So this should start back in preschooler, but definitely in school age. They should get either a award or some sort of allowance for doing chores. Now in my house, they didn't get money, but we would say, we're gonna go to the movies on Friday if everybody does what they're supposed to do. You know, or after we get our, um, our grades come in, our report cards. They're good. Oh, we're going to do this or that. So something um, should be there. And again, that doing something, that allowance or that reward also gives them those things to say, okay, I'd rather give me the $5. And when I earn enough money, I want to go and buy whatever it is that they want. Maybe it's another video game. That's usually what it is today. So parents of a seven-year-old immunocompromised boy state they, they want to get a dog for their son. The parents tell the nurse that they have read some studies about the positive influence and benefits of pet ownership, but they want to know what risks may be involved. What information can the nurse provide the parents about some of the diseases transmitted by dogs to humans and how the parents might protect the children from these risks? It's right now my seven-year-old grandson wants a dog. He is not immunosuppressed. Can you imagine a dog on an immunosuppressed child? Is that a good thing? What about just regular allergies and hair? My daughter is allergic to dogs, um, especially well, pet dander in general. But she loves dogs. And every single time she gets around my brother's dog, she goes and she plays with a dog. And then she's like, mom, can I have that Allegra now? Can I have that Claire? Because <laughs> she's in broke out in highs, but she won't leave the dad on dogs alone. <laughs> it's true. Kids, you know, they, they think they're cute. I mean, the benefits of pet ownership are good. If the, if the child is taught how to take care of it, how to walk it, how to feed it, how to bathe it, all of those things. But an immunosuppressed child, is there in hyperallergenic dogs? Well, actually there is, but again, they cost money, a lot of money. And remember, they need all of their immunizations. Also, rabies is a big thing, right? And dog bites are very dirty. So a lot of those things, is it good for a seven-year-old immunocompromised boy to have a dog? That's debatable. It's, I would say no. But I'm being a meanie, aren't I? 
<laughs> so adolescence. Now we're above 12. You know, in a hospital, we call it um, up to age 18, but we know pediatric hospitals, they'll take kids to 21. Now, what happens in adolescence? They get their breasts, they get their curves, they're going to get their menses. And we know school age is the end um, of that. The permanent teeth are in, their menstruation starts, and they start to become young adults. The end of adolescence is when now they've grown, they've gone through all of their puberty, and they've gone through a lot of emotional ups and downs. Now, what are adolescents all about? And it is Erickson establishing an identity. What does that mean? Well, adolescence, who am I? What do I wanna be? Where am I gonna go to school? Do I like girls? Do I like boys? What group am I gonna hang out with? Is it the band group? Is it this group? Is it that group? It's all of these things that in between kid to adult, trying to figure out the direction of their life. And it is frustrating. It's all about body image. Who am I? What do I look like? And what happens when you start with menstruation and puberty? Pimples, right? You know, and... Uh, too heavy, too skinny, too freckly, too curly hair, all of these things. It's all about who am I? What do I look like? Also, more time is spent away from the family now. They're at school. They're at school activities. They're at friends' houses. They're at school dances, sports. They're out on the weekend, here, there, everywhere. So a lot more exposure to other culture, other people. Also, when you talk about Freud, all about intimacy. It's that sexual curiosity that not, now start to take over, right? So they're going through so much. Um, one of the things is with these children, they really um, have a hard time uh, with parents. They want the independence, so it's no responsibilities, of course. Communication between adolescents and parents can be really silent, or, you know, it could be explosive um, because, you know, they don't want a parent to tell them what to do. You know, their bodies are rapidly changing, you know, and they have all of these sexual desires, and they don't know what to do all with it. And they just think parents are there you know, to make them look silly or you know, they have to come home early and nobody else does. And why do I have to? You know, it's now going into that adolescent trying to figure out what and how I need to do formal operations, Piaget, to get what I want. So, as I said, Erickson is intimacy. It's identity. It's all about sexuality. It's all about who am I? And that Piaget, as I said, figuring out I was grounded on Monday because I whatever, talked back to mom or did whatever. Um, and on Friday, I want to go out with my friends bowling. But mommy already said, no, I can't go. Well, what can I do up till Friday to make my mother change your mind, right? Abstract thinking. Nobody taught them this. I'm going to get an A on the test. I'm going to take the garbage out. I'm going to make my bed. I'm going to put my clothes away. I'm going to take a shower before she asks. All of this stuff, right? Because that's abstract. What can I do to fight my way out of the paper bag to get what I want? That is an adolescent. And we know Freud's all about the exploration and sexuality genital stage. Growth and development, we know everything is changing quick getting hair in places you didn't know, boys thinking they need to shave with razors before they need to, but they're going to do it anyway because they're growing. It's all about all of these hormones that are going on there. This is a picture of all the stuff that goes on. 
We know we go from pudgy children up to shapely uh, women with breasts and with waist and with hips, long legs, you know, and our skin hopefully will clear out. And, you know, it goes through all of that, all those stages. In the meantime, that adolescent's worried about it the whole way through body image. As I said, boys, uh, girls are before boys, usually two years before. That's why girls tend to look more mature than boys. We also know that as they're into that pre-adolescent, that 12 to 14, this is that pre-adolescent growth spurt that occurs. They'll grow up to 20 to 25% of their whole height in those two to three years. So now you have long legs, long arms, you know, and they're gaining weight like crazy because they're getting tall and the arms and legs, they're getting bigger, you know, and this is all part of that pre-adolescent growth spurt. My son in eighth grade was five foot six, 120 pounds. And all of a sudden when he was 20, He's six foot four and 220 pounds. I mean, they grow. This is all the adolescent. And I'm telling you, all different ages within this, they're going to be doing this growth spurt and going through puberty and the voice is changing and all of that and the pimples and oily skins and sweats. The boys will get hair on their face, their chest, their axilla and the pubic areas, their shoulders are getting bigger. We're getting that six pack now, hopefully. That voice is going deeper. It's less soprano alto, becomes more tenor or bass, right? We know the first thing that happens is the scrotal enlargement, and then it goes in the genitals, increasing in size. And we know this nocturnal emissions, you know, is when they're dreaming and they have an orgasm at night when they're asleep. It's normal on boys going through adolescence. Now, boys need to be just like girls. Girls need to do breast exams. Boys need to do testicular self exams. So as I said, girls, they're changing. As I said, they're getting the breasts, they're getting the thighs, the hips, you know, and this is all normal. It has to do with menstruation and all those hormones. And as I said, girls are two years before. Now, how do you stage sexuality? Well, Tanner's is the stage, and t- stages that you'll see. And it shows how you start out with nothing and end up with something, okay? So it's really stages one through five. One is you're a child. And then two, girls are going to get breast buds, first thing, boys and large testicles. And then it goes on to stages three, four, and five is a normal adult body. So stage one is nothing, no change. Five is that full adult size body. As I said, sense of identity, who am I? You know, and then of course it's that other people around them trying to tell them what and how to do, right? Their sense of intimacy, again, figuring out who they are, what do they um, want to be? Um, Again, it goes into spirituality. Do I want, you know, a church and some sort of spiritual um, relationship? Things like that are really looked at Uh, earlier in life you know, parents bring their kids to church and Sunday school. Well, that's where they go. Well, as adolescents are getting to the point where are they going to continue that after they move out of the house, right? Values um, is something, again, it came from the family um, and hopefully what they were taught at earlier ages keeps up with them. You know, that they learn to be polite. They, they learn uh, right and wrong, right? And Um, we know body image, you know, it's huge. They get a pimple on the end of their nose before a date. They're like, oh my God, you believe this pimple. And it's all about the pimple. They're beautiful except for this pimple, right? And then we know that all the peers, if somebody gets those cool Nike sneakers, well, everybody wants those Nike sneakers, right? They're trying to be looking like the peers. Everybody gets an iPhone. Well, they want their iPhone. It's 
part of that being familiar, being a part of the group. So a patient's mother complains to the nurse that her 14-year-old son has become increasing lazy in the past couple of years. He lies around the house, sleeps all day on Saturdays, complains about being tired a lot. How can you explain this behavior? They're 14. Something's going on there. Are they depressed? Has something happened to them? I mean, this is after the growth it, spurt. It okay? could be it could be depression, but it also could be just um sometimes people late bloomers even, you know, and that rest is kind of like rest and digest where he try his body trying to catch up with all the hormones that's changing with the uh, growth hormones and everything that's going on in his body to get him to produce everything that he need as far as um, testosterone and all of that. So, you know, that, that, that could be excellent. Yes, very can good. It be puberty, would, would that happen? Puberty could be part of it too. Absolutely. You know, and, you know, when I see sleeps a lot of time and tired a lot, you know, something's going on and maybe it's how about iron deficiency anemia. It could be some sort of that needs to be looked at. So there's all different stuff. Remember, adolescents don't like to eat. They want to be skinny. So are they eating right? Peer relationships, you know, usually we like same sex peers, but now they are also exploring, you know, other people too. We know that there's cliques. There's the band group, the sports group. There's the um, the rock group, right? There's all different types developing what you want to be. What is that relationship? There's a lot of stress on these kids and trying to fit in. Piaget, again, this is all about figuring out what they can do to get what they want. I mean, there's a lot of words here, but basically it talks about, you don't have to see it to know it, but you have prior incidents as you remember, but it's developing new ideas on trying to get what you want, developing your own values, you know, being who you are. And that's all about formal. I get more when I use good manners. <laughs> I'm going to do that. And that, nobody taught them that. That is part of formal. And they saw getting good uh, outcomes when they were in school age. So that's where it continues. As I said, sexual behavior, it's all about, you know, who's, what type of sex. You know, we know that we would like to think that there's not group sex, uh, uh, we know that there are all different types of partners. You know, that's all experimentation and, and that is all okay. The problem comes when there's unplanned pregnancies and usually the girl usually at first won't tell anybody because they're ashamed, right? And especially sexually transmitted infections, STDs, right? Very... Uh, as a nurse, especially school nurses, we would tell them where to go to get help. And a teenager can go to things like Planned Parenthood or somewhere without a mother or father. They're allowed to go and get help. And as a nurse, we can give them written and oral information. We don't give them our opinions, okay? Sexual education, again, is hard. They're trying to explore the way that they want. You know, uh, everything should be explained. Sure, abstinence, contra contraception should be discussed. But again, everything you need written and oral information and uh, giving them a good platform to make best choices, right? Um, and then accepting children at, or adults, the adolescents, as who they are. And not saying um, you don't believe in, you know, homosexuality or you don't believe in whatever they're into. You know, that's who they are. You just got to give them the information to be safe in whatever relationship. 
So parents and kids, like I said, it's very hard. Parents try to put down their rules and adolescents want to know and do what they want to do. It's important that you try to keep um, good communications. And one of the things I would recommend is to sit down with that adolescent who wants to do things and to um, ask them, both of them, so what do you want from this? And make a compromise and make a contract together. That's usually the best way if the parents are willing and open to these things. Another thing we need as parents to be aware of is looking for things like, is the kids on the um, computer looking at sex sites or into um, these group rooms where we have these perverts trying to pick up these young children, you know, or uh, making phone calls that you don't know where they're going could be one of those type of things. Just being aware because this is a very fragile group. And if somebody's listening to them, talking to them, they might do something stupid because they don't know that. You know, they don't, no, nobody would do that. They've not seen it yet, right? As I said, nutrition, nutrition, these kids, they don't eat right, they skip meals. They tend to get a power bar and a water bottle and go out for the day. And they're not getting all of the calcium, iron, and B12. And those are the things that you see the lowest levels of. So we know that if we're in a vegetarian diet, we need to have good sources of protein, beans, right? One of the things. Sports and nutrition. If kids are out in sports, they do need to have good nutrition. They're out there running around burning calories. They need to have the nutrition for them to be able to be as physically active and do what they want to do with their body. And caffeine and alcohol should be um, not given. I mean, it goes to say, but we have to tell them. And we know that there is such a high stress for kids to do well, to get into colleges and sports, right? To really tell them these anabolic steroids, it will create problems, whether it's um, bone growth problem or it gets into heart valve problems later on to let them know. They should bathe. Kids are getting piercings. My son came home with a tongue piercing. I'm like, what are you, crazy? But it's things that kids will do and making sure that it was taken care of properly. Making sure they get dental care, that they you know, brush their teeth, that they um, do all of the, the dental hygiene that they should. And sunbathing. You know, girls think a nice, good suntan is great. Remember, I live in South Florida. Make sure they're using UV uh, protection sunscreens. Safety, motor vehicles is always number one, right? Now they're adolescents, they're driving. Or you have a friend who's driving and kids are climbing on the hoods of the car and they're going around parking lots and flinging kids off onto the gravel, right? Making sure that um, they are safe. Swimming and water safety practice is again, important, important. Always wear appropriate gear. You know, when we're doing any sort of sports, um, whether it's riding a bike, to football, soccer. And there are a lot of eating disorders. Anorexia, where you don't eat, and bulimia, where you eat a lot, and vomit, 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 okay? And uh, when we're not eating right, we always worry about bone health. Drug use, you know, they're gonna be out there experimenting. Um, alcohol is the number one they try for, but you know, there's all stuff out there. And we know a kid who's having multiple mood swings. We see a kid's depressed or, you know, isolating a lot. We know one of the things we need to suspect could be drug use and education is the best thing that we could do. And yes, young teenagers, adolescents can become addicted and getting them whatever appropriate referral they need for it. As I mentioned earlier, we're talking about that kid who's sleeping a lot, right? Depression is a big thing. Kids aren't performing the way they should. You know, they got pregnant, you know, and now they're depressed. Or my best friend is now dating the boyfriend that I wanted. I mean, so many stuff goes on in adolescence. 
So again, it's recognizing those children showing those behaviors and having a good open communication. As I said, pregnancy, figuring it out, once they determine what they're going to do, getting them into what uh, care that we can, um, and then being for them to, um, and teaching with good nutrition um, and good you know, activities and keeping them in line, getting them through school, right? And there's ways to do that and being supportive. So adolescents, you got to open that communication. You know, you're just like a parent. Oh, why are they going to talk to you? You know, talk about, oh, I see you have a New York Yankee shirt on. Oh, I love the Yankees. Or, wow, you're listening to music. Who is that you're listening to? Oh, yeah, I like that one. Yeah, I went to a concert. Now you've broken open that communication, haven't you? Now you're less threatening. When you need to speak to them, something sexually, things that they won't speak in front of the mother, get the mother and father out of the room. You may speak to them alone. You do not need to tell the parents what they said, unless it's harm to themselves or others, okay? So there's a lot of things nurses can do to get them um, opening and talking. Healthcare is a little bit of everything, all the things we just said, nutrition, dental, personal, body, accident, substance abuse, et cetera. So basically teenagers, they're a rough group. They're hard to work with, but they, um, they're, they, they grow up to be great adults if we allow them to, um, you know, be able to talk, to be able to communicate. So let me get the, the cahoots up quick, and we're going to go from there. One second. Again, I will put these cahoots. I will have them on your announcements. They will be there so you can have it. And here we go. I'm going to get through this quick. I'm going to go fast with it. Why don't you want to go? Let me try another way how to get in there. One second. Here we are. Always one more way to skin a cat, isn't it? I will get in there. Now I'm going to go quick through these because I know we're getting to the end of the class. All right, let me get going because we got to get her done. Week two. A preschool child is asked, why do trees have leaves? Which response would be an example of animism? That means it acts like an animal, right? 
Is it for the squirrels to play in? It's a hard concept. I can't see. Oh, I was about to say the blue. I was about. Yeah. What they do is they have leaves because they can hide, so you can't see them. I mean, there's all different things that you could say with it. Is a trunk because you can hide behind it, or they have leaves on it so they don't get wet when it rains. I mean, there's all different types of things. But the point of this question is how an inanimate object becomes an animal and they could play with it like that. I can't see the other sides of the questions, but. When selecting play activities for a healthy four-year-old, the parent should be guided to understand that they enjoy what? Four-year-olds. Now I'm going to go through partial of this cahoots or 60 questions. It takes you far too over. I'm going to take you at about 30 and stop. And then I'll send you the cahoots that you can finish. Okay. So a four-year-old, remember, now they're starting to be able to play associative and they're starting to cooperate and they're being playing with each other. So cooperative play. They can now work together as a goal. Cephalocaudal describes development that what? Head to toe. Right, because they move their head first. Absolutely. And then they walk, which is the caudal. What task would be appropriate to expect of a five-year-old child? Oh, my God. How do we do this? Oh, my God. I don't know what I did. So on your phones, you should see the colors. And on the screen, you could see what it is. So five-year-old, you got to keep them safe. So it's setting the table with paper plates. You'll be able to do that. You wouldn't have them with glasses or knives. They still can hurt themselves. A father's concern about how long his preschool age child will continue sucking his thumb. What's the best response? Is it green? So remember, I said usually you want them to stop before their permanent teeth come in, which is school age. So they usually by then stop. The kids tease them. And usually that's why they stop. A way a child grow and develop is known as what? Development. <laughs> Called maturation. That's how they mature. They grow and develop. What should the nurse suggest is the most appropriate toy choice for a three-year-old? Remember, you always worry about safety, right? Toys and young children, you always think safety. A large construction set. That's a very good answer because they can play with it, they can change it, and they can have fun with it, right? A plush toy is a younger kid, a toddler. What fear is unique to the preschool period? Say it's all about body harm. Remember, this is age of band-aids. They're going to bleed. They're going to bleed to death. It's all part of it. That goes afraid of dark, afraid of large dogs, afraid of actually castration. It's another one, preschoolers. What do abnormal results on a Denver 2 screening test indicate? Ooh. 
uh, indicates delays in growth and development. So it doesn't look at that. Yes, there is those delays, but what it's telling you, you need further investigation. Why are they abnormal? Do they need speech, physical, occupational therapy? Is it nutrition? What's going on? Why aren't they where they should be? And it's not intellect at all. When planning an activity for a three-year-old, the nurse bases the plan on average attention span of how many minutes? Three-year-old, how many minutes? <clears throat> about 15 minutes if you're lucky right they can't sit in their seat a four-year-old insists he has more money with a nickel than his father who has a dime for Piaget why is this true and this has to do with conservation in Piaget. As in you have two cups, one short and fat, one's tall and skinny. And if you pour them into each other, it's the same liquid. But because this one's taller and bigger, you're going to say the tall one has more. And intuition. it's called intuition. And it's all about that nickel's bigger. It must be more money because the dime is tiny. It has to be less money. This is the way they think. Why should the nurse keep in mind when planning to teach a fourth grade class about nutrition? Fourth graders, what do they need to know about nutrition? How do you teach them? <clears throat> so school age children, concrete. Remember, school age is concrete. That's concrete operations. And then the adolescence, formal. So concrete means they've seen it and they can understand it. So now they're logical. They can say, oh, you need this and this and this. So because it makes your bones grow, whatever. They can think that way now. Younger kids don't. What do you call a type of family that is traditional? For example, one mother and father and their biological children. Remember, there's all types of families, right? Nuclear. And yes, it is nuclear. Very good. If a new mother states she cannot breastfeed her baby, what would you recommend? Now, as I say, the best thing is breastfeeding, but not every mother can do it. Formula. What type of formula? Iron fortified formula. There you go. That's the difference there. Iron fortified formula, not just regular. They need the iron. Yes. Just like it's iron fortified cereals when we start. An eight-year-old child is frequent nightmares and the parents are concerned. What's the nurse's best response? Do eight-year-olds have nightmares? And their night terrors? It's absolutely normal. And again, this has to do with that mutilation. You know, feeling that they're cut, their insides come out, they're, they're bleeding out. Still, it's part of the school age, as I said. A 10-year-old girl likes school, plays the flute, plays tennis. What do these activities help develop? She likes it. She's good at it. I play the flute. I play tennis. What is that? Industry. That is the house, the factory they built. That is the industry. Tasks they do well versus inferiority what they cannot do well and want to. What statement by an 11-year-old child leads a nurse to determine he has moved from the mindset of egocentrism? What is egocentrism? Ego, 
all about me, me, mine, mine, right? That's your toddler too. They're egocentric. All these fancy words, right? Ego, me. So again, when they stop thinking about themselves, they think of others. I'm sorry, I better hurt your feelings. That's how that got there. The school nurse is preserving a tooth that was knocked out. What will the nurse be especially careful to do? It's not uncommon a tooth comes out root and all, whether it's, you know, on a, a monkey bars, you know, falling down in a cement thing, uh, on the side of a pool a lot. Um, you'll see teeth come out. How do you transport that tooth? Because we can put them back in. So we never touch the root, only the enamel top. And you put it in cold milk and send them to pediatric dentist or into an ER. They numb it and they can shove it back in, especially if it's a permanent tooth. You don't want to spend how many thousands of dollars getting a rod and a fake tooth then. If you get it pushed in and it will stay there, that's the best thing, right? So it can be, it can be done. What term is used for a baby that is up to four weeks old? First year of life, we usually say infants, right? What's that first four weeks called? It's a neonate. After the 28 days, it's infant. The nurse is assessing a 13-year-old boy, which physical change indicates that male puberty has begun. When did I, what did I tell you? What's the first thing that happens? On a girl, it's breast buds. It's the enlargement of the testicles, yes. Very good. A parent comments that her adolescent daughter seems to be daydreaming a lot. What does this behavior indicate? <clears throat> so Something's going on, and she's thinking about it and trying to figure it out. Formal operations, right? So she's preparing. That's usually what daydreaming is about. They're overwhelmed in thought. The nurse is planning care of an adolescent. What psychosocial task is most important for the adolescent? Psychosocial. Erickson, industry, school age, initiative is preschool, and identity is your adolescence. Very good. I think we hit a lot of theorists. When does the first tooth generally appear? It's last week stuff, and I will do this to you. Trying to reemphasize. Six months, so at eight months, Eight minus six, maybe two teeth would be what they'd have. It doesn't mean they all get teeth at the same age, though. What can the nurse suggest as a good dietary source of zinc for an adolescent who is vegetarian? Remember, they're not eating well. They may be that tired person, right? Could be part of iron deficiency, could be other minerals and stuff that they're missing. So if it's a zinc, we're going to be giving nuts. That's zinc. Now you know that one, right? A nurse takes the height and weight and there's vital signs on an infant. What level of Maslow's hierarchy of needs is that? Remember, it starts out from basic needs all the way up to what makes them feel good. You will see Maslow's on the exam. So I said, basic needs, height, weight, vital signs. That's what you have. That's yours. That's the beginning physiologic needs. Good. A six-month 
At six months, solid foods is offered. What would be the best choice? The first one, what are you gonna give? Rice cereal, why? It's the least allergenic of everything. And it's usually rice cereal, iron fortified. All the cereals are today. According to Freud, an infant that likes to suck on a pacifier a lot is in which developmental period? It's all about their mouth and oral, right? The, everything in the mouth, self soothes through the mouth, and it's Freud, mouth. A toddler, anal, all about potty training. What stage are toddlers in, according to Erickson? What, which, which one was it? I was thinking of something else. It was the autonomy. Autonomy. Autonomy versus shame and doubt. Remember, autonomy, me, me, mine, mine. It's all about toddlers. Yes, it is. Industry, school age, trust versus mistrust, infants. Initiative, preschooler. What reflex causes an infant to stick their tongue out when you place solid food on it? So you put food on it at six months and they, with their tongue. They don't know how to do that yet. They put it in and get it in. It's called protrusion reflex. That tongue sticks out. Parachute is when you put them on their tummy and you lay them down, their hands and their feet comes up. And Palmer, you know it's that grasp that they do. And this is the last one I'll do tonight. The girl tells, tells the nurse, I love Katy Perry. I want to be a singer. This statement is typical at what stage? So that's in that early adolescence. You know, that is that 12, 11, 12 area that you see those sort of things. So I did 30 of them. I'm going to stop for tonight. We've gone a long way. Um, anything that you guys need, let me know. Remember, your exam one reviews are going to be started this week. Mine starts on Monday, and you'll have that recording by Monday evening that you can start on it. I'm going to be sending out your uh, study guides um, as soon as I get done and get your uh, the recording from this I'll make sure I send out week one again for you all right you have the kahoot you have the recording and you have the powerpoint so I know that you have gotten everything anything else you all need it's gonna be Monday evening right